We are two. This is a One School for All lecture by me, Andrew Thomas, at Ostwald University College, which I would like my wonderful international students to watch by um, Halloween on the 31st of October 2023, when we next meet. So we're going to talk about Miguel Christ's idea of the two hemispheres. We're going to talk about what he says about them, what they're like, and how we can use them as teachers. Who was, um, or who is in Miguel Christ? He's still alive um, and he's uh, thriving. Um, released, uh, uh, published a new book two years ago. Um, and um, but the reason I say was, was he started life as um, as a literary um, professor. He was lecturing in literature in Oxford, um, and he became extremely interested in the mind-body problem. What Descartes would have said is the relationship between things that think and things that are extended. Um, and, and that led him to then take a training in medicine and neurology, and eventually uh, working in uh, both neurology and neurosurgery. So he get, gets down to what you see is going on in the brain when different things happen. Um, and he still today publishes in such completely different publications as like, for example, the Times Literary Supplement, Literature, um, and The Lancet, which is you know, one of the world's biggest and most important medical journals. So in these two extremely different contexts and extremely different disciplines, he's constantly identifying some of the same problems, which is to say, what are the neurological and the physical effects of art and meaning? Uh, when we listen to music and when we appreciate it, um, when poetry sparks off something in us, both the visceral feelings, but also the thought processes, what is going on? And this led him to distinguish between the two hemispheres of the brain. Now, the two hemispheres of the brain are not a new idea. Um, anyone who's seen a brain can see that it's um, that there are two quite different bits of the brain. Our brain, whether we like it or not, is divided down the middle. It's connected as well, but it's divided down the middle. And um, until maybe the 60s or 70s, we would sometimes want to know what does the left hand do and what does the right hand of the brain do? Um, but that, by the time um, Ian McGilchrist studied this, that was already something dissatisfactory um, because when you look at functions of what people are actually doing with their brain, you see that um, they always involve both of them. There's always a line connecting. There's always some, some kind of collaboration between the two hemispheres, whatever we're doing, whether we're playing the piano, walking the dog or doing maths, um, all of those things involve um, to both parts of the brain. But there are still two hemispheres, and even though people kind of stopped talking about the significance of the two, um, the two halves, um, you can't get around the fact that that is what the brain looks like. And actually, the, uh, the big connections um, between them, um, you can identify what's going on there. So, and, and, they, and they tend to inhibit each other rather than kind of loving this <laughs> um, this connection, um, they're, they're inhibitory. So um, there are discernible differences, but Ian McGilchrist says it's not a question of what does each do, but it's a question of how they do it. And he identifies um, certain characteristics. For example, um, for the left side of the brain, everything that you see is an example of a category. So when you see a, a mouse, you think this is a mouse, this is a rodent, this is an animal, and, and, it's, and it's an example of, of a greater uh, number of things. Now, the right hand of the brain tends to see this as one individual thing. So, um, so rather than saying it's an example of a, of a particular species, it will say, well, this is Ralph, Ralph the mouse. Um, so the right hand of the brain um, looks at unique phenomena, whereas the left hand of the brain looks at categories. And therefore, the left hand of the brain tends to filter things for logic and procedures, for what are we doing right here and now? Ignore the other characteristics. Ignore the fact that it's a mouse that's, I don't know, um, that's dyed its hair purple and, um, and is attacking me with, a, uh, with, an, with an axe. Um, it's a mouse, and at the moment I need a mouse in order to do my mouse experiment. So, uh, whereas the right hand of the brain will look at the broader picture of things, uh, look at the implicit meaning, not one particular characteristic 
Um, but what does this mean in the massive picture of the world right now? And of course, the, ma um, the mouse um, is not just a mouse, but um, but we happen to be on the set for a, a great mouse movie, which will be the great next great Marvel Cinematic Universe contribution. Um, so that is the context that the right sees things in. And the left tends to take things quite literally and quite abstractly. So like, like I say, categories, very verbal. Um, most of speech today um, is, um, is controlled by left. Um, speech, that is to say, when we say stuff, um, that will be controlled by the left. So um, it, it, it boils things down to what is relevant for here and now, whereas the right tends to be more closely connected to the body and the image of the body is on the right side of the brain. So, so it's, um, it doesn't say so much, but it listens and it understands the context of where we are and how this can affect me. So it, and it can understand things metaphorically and poetically in ways that the left doesn't because it boils things down for what it's doing right now. So two quite different ways of approaching the same reality. And both of these are acting together um, um, crucially. So that's, that is the insight of Miguel Chris that we've got um, and that we've got two different ways of approaching the same reality. And McGilchrist, the whole book, um, wants to argue that, that we have privileged the left-hand side of the brain, um, and that if we're going to um, act well as human beings and live good lives and relate to both uh, the world, both artistically and scientifically, we need to reground the way we look at the world. We need to reground the... Uh, the approach and our way of being um, in and as um, the world that exists. And this for us as teachers means seeing our pupils differently. McGilchrist says, the words we use to describe human processes are highly influential for the way we conceive ourselves and therefore for our actions and above all for the values to which we hold. With a rising interest in neuroscience, we have an opportunity which we must not squander to sophisticate our understanding of ourselves. But we can only do so if we first sophisticate the language we use, since many current users of that language adopt it so naturally that they are not even aware of how it blinds them to the possibility that they might be dealing with anything other than a machine. So notice Emma Gilchrist wants us to to use both sides of the brain in order to see new things. And remember, the left wanted to boil things down to the relevance of what we're doing right here and now, whereas the right is able to perceive new things. It sees new things which are unique rather than just um, things which will fit into our paradigm, into our scheme of interpretation. Which means that ultimately there is something wrong with treating pupils simply as objects of science. Um, if we are going to treat pupils well, both as artistic and scientific teachers, um, then we need to activate our right hemisphere and allow um, pupils to emerge as something that we have not understood yet. But this is a pretty damning criticism of a massive chunk of educational research. Why does this make a difference to us as teachers? Well, we've spoken a great deal about pupil brains, but we need to be aware that our own brains have histories and educations and tendencies too. They're trained to process, identify, interpret, and react to particular signs and symptoms, as we have discussed before in the context of special needs education, but also assessment for learning. We've spoken about the need to be both sensitive to educational cues, but also to relational ones. But if we get too involved in our processing, we might end up with just one of those things, because the processing, like we said, uh, which applies to the left hand of uh, the left hemisphere, is unable to see new things, see unique uh, phenomena. McGilchrist is making an argument against reductionism. And at the end of the day, we need to train our brains to understand exceptional students, but also to listen. We need to allow ourselves to see something else. <laughs>